Hello and welcome to Echo at Africa, our environment magazine program that highlights efforts at environmental protection brought to you live from Lagos, Nigeria. Today we talk about the protection of lions in Ethiopia and then we ask why climate change is a security risk and finally why petrol power stations have become so popular in Germany. Senegal, like many other African countries, has a problem with crop monocultures. One man is trying to change that. Our eco-hero this week had some innovative ideas to tackle the situation. He started farming cooperatives and cultivated different species, a great idea that turned out to be a model for a whole region. Meke is a small town in Senegal. Ibrahim Asek is from Senegal's National Federation of Organic Producers. He explains how peanuts first came to Senegal. Peanut farming was introduced by France when this was still a colony. Peanuts were almost the only crop in the entire region, and that had huge knock-on effects. The results of monoculture for over a hundred years. Even today, around 50% of farming land in Senegal is used to grow peanuts, if they grow at all, that is. Ibrahim Asek is here to meet the president of the local farmers' association. Falilou Danier says the ground on which they are standing used to provide food for their families. But now it is completely barren. Plants are barely able to take root in the soil. And that has serious consequences. Peanut monoculture causes severe damage to the soil. A loss of biodiversity means a loss of natural resources, earth, water, trees, and plant biomass. As a result, Senegal is forced to import a lot of its food, and export figures for peanuts are declining. Ibrahim Asek and Falilou Danier are working hard to change the situation. They don't want to give up their livelihoods as farmers. This is where the peanuts are stored that are harvested by the local farmers. Danier explains that the crop is meager in comparison to the amount of land farmed. Cette famille là euh donc vous voyez la production ici. One family has managed to grow 616 kilos on two hectares of land. That's not very much. Around 200 euros for an annual harvest. That's why many farmers are turning to other crops like cassava, but there's no long-term perspective. That's why young people don't want to stay here. They move someplace else. First they go to the city, and then to Europe or the United States. And that's not all. They're so desperate that they get into small boats and cross the Atlantic. The farmers here in Mekhey have formed a cooperative and launched a small-scale oil production business. First, the women from the cooperative shell and peel the peanuts and boil them. Then they are pressed several times. The oil is for the members' own use and is also sold at local markets. But farming methods will have to change if an income is to be guaranteed in future years. The soil needs to recover, and Ibrahim Asek says there is only one way to achieve that. 
We have to work with nature instead of trying to dominate it. We need ethically acceptable farming methods, and that means biological and agroecological methods. That's the future of farming, not just in Senegal, but worldwide. Otherwise, the consequences of industrial monocultures, from barren soil to migration, cannot be prevented. Five years ago, Germany decided to phase out nuclear power and turn to renewables instead. But the energy turnaround comes at a price. Wind and solar power, for one, are heavily subsidized. And although there's so much public money going into renewables, energy harnessed from the sun and the wind is not in constant supply. But there is a silver lining on Germany's troubled green energy horizon, virtual power plants. It stinks. There's nothing virtual about it. The bad smell in the air is very real, but this farmer doesn't mind. Norbert Duca's gas plant is bubbling along nicely today. Organic materials are rotting and fermenting and stinking. It means there's a good amount of gas going into the generators. They then produce electricity. Electricity from biogas is the most expensive of the renewable energies, so you really have to get the most out of it. Its main advantage is the controllability of this form of power production, because you can store the gas in the gas membranes. I have a personal and idealistic reason for helping to establish network stability in order to take advantage of the edge that the biogas sector has. So biogas provides predictable electricity, unlike wind turbines. There are several of those around Duker's farm. Today they're spinning, but yesterday they stood still. That's why Duker's rotting manure makes up an important building block in a much larger complex. Together, more than 1,000 small facilities form one large power plant. They're owned by farmers like Duker's with solar roofs, wind turbines, biogas generators. Together, they're as powerful as a nuclear plant. How does that work? The secret is in these two floors at an old factory building in Cologne. There's no generator, no turbines, just computers that make up a virtual power plant. It's a data processing center, only it's calculating electricity output. The only physical thing is this box. It connects all the facilities outside to the mainframe and adds up the energy that's fed into it. The engineer has a lot to do right now because more people want to get involved. The box communicates through this modem and sends the data to the guidance system, or the guidance system can transmit signals to the box. Communicating small power plants, with each one individually controllable. Two young economists came up with the idea seven years ago. They had the old coal fire plants in their sites. Today they trade more than 180 million euros worth of electricity and are making a profit. We want renewable energies to take over system responsibility. The appropriate system has been created for that, so that renewables can do what they do best, which is make up for temporary fluctuations in the power grid. That was our jumping off point, where we said we could network a lot of renewable energy plants, which can even out fluctuations, and they can take over the same network output that conventional plants used to provide. And it works. Here a new biogas facility is still just a pin on the map because it has to be tested. Can it be easily remote controlled? The farmers let their small facilities be adjusted from outside. That makes the electricity marketable, so it's worth it. Back with farmer Dukas. As a provider of green energy, he of course also drives an electric car, powered by his own electricity. He thinks the network solution is brilliant. Today, with so much wind and sun, his gas isn't in such demand. Back in Cologne, his output is reduced and he's given financial compensation. This down regulation can vary a lot. Sometimes there isn't one for two weeks, then it happens ten times a day. It depends on network demand. With this farmer, the usually silent electricity also gets its own sound in the form of a bug zapper in the pigsty. The ideal ecological cycle is shown here. 
The liquid manure goes into the biogas facility and produces electricity. Corn is added and the fermentation substrate is sprayed on the fields as fertilizer. This closed-loop system, which has been used since the Middle Ages, gives my business a great deal of stability and is ecologically valuable. The weather forecast for the next few days is for rain and very little wind. That means Duca's smelly electricity will be in demand again. From virtual power stations to some great British grannies, these women love knitting. But what was once just a hobby is now a way of helping people look good while being green. Find out how these grannies are doing their bit for the environment with Crocheted Creations. Synthetic fibers in the clothes we wear are made from oil. As more than 5% of globally extracted oil goes into the textile industry, climate change is also influenced by what we wear. Garments are often mass-produced by workers earning very low wages. By contrast, Happy Grannies in Britain and Macedonia are knitting for customers who want to design their own gloves, sweaters and scarves. The grannies use pure wool from sustainably farmed merino sheep. So Holly, Margaret and many other knitting grannies are doing their bit for the environment. We like that. Are you doing your bit too? If so, tell us about it. You can visit our website or send us a tweet. And we'll share your stories. Cool grannies, you might say. And now, let's head back to Africa. Ethiopia's Kafar region is believed to be the cradle of one of the finest coffee strains in the world. Its cloud forest also provides a safe haven for many animals, including lions. Though they are much feared by the local people, nobody would dare to harm them. That's because in Kafar, the Lion King still rules, thanks to the special place it has in the culture there. A television camera right in front of his fence. That's something Janu does not like at all. He's one of six males in the lion reserve near Addis Ababa. The animals have plenty of room here and lots of peace and quiet. There used to be exhibition pieces in the presidential palace. The rangers tell us that lions are sensitive animals and very special ones, especially in Ethiopia. We've come to this country to learn about lions, wild, free, living in their natural habitat. So we leave the high rises of the capital behind us and drive 12 hours to the southwest. Paved roads become gravel tracks, barren plateaus become green rainforest. Many people consider the Kaffa region and its cloud forest one of the most beautiful areas in Ethiopia. It's a UNESCO biosphere reserve with an area close to 900 square kilometers. That's about the size of Berlin. At least a dozen African lions are said to live here. But the probability of sighting one of these nocturnal animals is virtually nil. <laughs> After trekking over the hills of the village Boka, we meet Asad Haila. It's been three years since her very unusual encounter with a lion. During the night, a hungry lioness broke into her hut through a hole in the wall and attacked two goats. After that, Asayat says, the lion got into the family bed. We always sleep in the same hut with our animals. It was pitch black, and at first I didn't know what was going on. Then the lion attacked me. You can see the scars on my face and head. I didn't realize what was happening until I felt its claws and heard it growling. Asayat was very lucky. The lioness only wounded her slightly and then left her alone. Her husband said the lioness stayed in the hut for two hours, ate one of the goats, and then disappeared. The Nature Protection Organization, NABU, has its offices in the regional capital, Lion Central, so to speak. 
In 2011, Nabu caused a scientific sensation with the report that there were lions in the cloud forest of Kaffa, a non-savanna area. Several studies are being carried out to find out when and why lions settled in Kaffa on their migratory route from Central to East Africa, how many animals there are, and just how they live in the cloud forest. The first focus of NABU is to conserve the forest, this cloud forest, and its biodiversity. And lions are one of the biodiversity component. It has importance because it, it completes the food web chain which existed in this area. It balances also the wildlife uh, population. There are other animals in Kaffa. Whether horses, oxen, or baboons, there's always something edible to satisfy a lion's hunger, quite unlike in the rest of the country. There are said to be only 1,500 lions left in Ethiopia, at the most. Their greatest enemies are humans. The country's population is growing by about 2 million people a year and robbing the lions of their habitat. That's why Nabu is especially anxious to protect the few lions in Kaffa and is planning to provide financial compensation to farmers whose livestock they've killed. In a country in which the lion is traditionally considered the king of beasts and sacred, people usually accord them deep respect. We want to find out more about that and visit a farmer, Alato Ado. He's 35, has six children, a few animals, and a small hut. He's one of the poorest of the poor. And several of his animals have been killed by lions. Because of that, he often takes the animals into his house, which already has hardly any room. We respect and honor lions. When they come and attack our livestock, we don't say they've killed them, but that they've taken them. We don't complain. Lions take what they need, and we accept that. In Kaffa, it would be out of the question to drive the lions away, let alone shoot them. We meet Ibeda Godo Imamo, the area's spiritual leader. He's a descendant of the royal family of the former kingdom of Kaffa. People here listen to what he says. He invites us to a traditional coffee ceremony and to a talk about lions. Here in Kaffa, people have lived with nature for generations. We respect all animals, but the lion is the king. Here and in the entire country, he symbolizes royalty. People see their old kings in him and honor him. That goes back many generations. When a lion dies, we treat him as if a person had died. Ibeda Godo takes us to a meadow behind the buildings. He tells us that a few years ago, when a lion was about to attack animals from the village, he prayed to his ancestors, and the lion died. The villagers then dug a hole in the meadow, covered the lion with traditional clothing, and buried it. Since then, its grave has been considered sacred. So at the end of our journey, we actually have come very close to a cloud forest lion in Kaffa. The tales of animal relations with man are always interesting. Also of interest is the information from the United Nations on climate change and risk to security. The UN has released some shocking data on climate change. It says global warming can increasingly be blamed for the world's worst natural catastrophes, whether droughts, floods or storms. But is climate change also a security risk? It could soon look like this in many more parts of the world. Global warming threatens countless people, but especially those in developing countries. The number of those who have to struggle to survive is rising worldwide. Does climate change pose a security risk? More than 660 million people have no access to clean drinking water, and there will be less and less of it to go around. 
nearly 800 million people are malnourished. Climate change is turning more and more regions into inhospitable wasteland. Once fertile soil is turning saline. And many areas are so arid that little grows there. Food is growing scarcer and more expensive. Unless we take swift action, the World Bank estimates that 100 million people will face extreme poverty over the next 15 years. Africa and East Asia will be hardest hit. To escape hunger and thirst, people will try to flee the affected regions. The struggle for resources will intensify and conflicts will proliferate. Extreme weather events will grow more common. Sea levels will rise. Storms and flooding will strike islands and coastal areas. Large stretches of land could be submerged. Cities and industrial centers will be affected. Weakening economies all over the world. Climate change threatens everyone on the planet, but its explosive potential is worst in states that are politically unstable or at war. Countries with weak economies could quickly face insurmountable problems. We can only stop climate change by working together. Like the Nigerian situation, Sally in Germany had oil drilled from her grounds in the 19th century. And although the wells are no longer spewing, the town is a major producer for the branch. Sally is today feeling the pinch of dwindling activity in that sector. We paid a visit to the town in crisis. An alarm goes off in the drill simulator. The crew tries to find out what's wrong. Is there a breach in the borehole? Everything's got to be checked. We're going to flush the borehole to find out whether we've got a problem. This is Europe's only school for master drillers. Environmental and safety concerns are an important part of the curriculum. The school is located in the German city of Zella, which is a big center for Germany's oil and gas industry. Oil rigs operated here until 50 years ago. All that's left now is the supply sector, which includes about 40 businesses. For example, Hartmann Valves and Wellheads specializes in drilling technology. All the parts the company makes are rigorously tested. The manager wants to make sure that during operations, there won't be any spills or accidents. Uh, the total weight is 200 tons. This is part of the wellhead. It's where the conveyor strands start. We hang about 150 to 200 tons off this element. A truck weighs about 20 tons, so we have to be able to hang about 10 trucks from it. Hartmann did about 25 million euros in turnover in 2015. That's a lot less than just a few years ago. One reason why is that the Russian market has been hit hard by a weak ruble, which makes German imports more expensive. In fact, a trade representative is here today to discuss the situation. The Russians need this equipment. In some cases, you cannot do without such products on very severe conditions like Harton produces. So that's why, all the same, we have to turn to Hartmann. A weak ruble and international sanctions imposed on Russia are regional problems. Additionally, the global crash in oil prices threatens the businesses in Sela. Nobody has lost their job at Hartmann yet, but that could soon change. The problem is that no one knows where oil prices are going to go now. Will they continue to fall? In Sela, around 8,000 jobs depend on the oil and gas industry. Back at the School for Master Drillers, the candidates have come here for specialized training. Most already have many years of drilling experience in the oil industry. They're also feeling the effects of the drop in oil prices. 
Vor einiger Zeit war es halt so, dass Lenkung. We used to have long-term contracts, two years, or if you were lucky, five years, with an option for five more. But those days are gone, thanks to the situation in this sector and the drop in oil prices. So it's just a matter of luck whether you get a long-term contract or have to scramble from job to job. A lot of deep drilling projects are now on hold. They'll only be profitable if oil prices rise again. That's all for today. Thank you so much for watching. Visit us on Facebook and on Twitter and share your ideas. You can also check out our website on your screen for more on our coverage of the environment and innovations in green technologies. We hope to see you back next week. Bye-bye.